This is a Culture Inject production. Welcome to our latest episode of the podcast. I am here and I'm joined as always by Shirag. Hey guys. Today we're discussing episode 9 titled Fever. Before we dive in, head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a rating and a review. And don't forget to follow us on social media for updates and sneak peeks. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram and YouTube at HBO The Nevers and on Twitter at HBO The Nevers and The Nevers Podcast, which is P-O-D-C-S-T. If any thoughts or questions, feel free to send an email to theneverspodcast at gmail.com. For anyone who missed it, Viola Predijan, who plays Myrtle, has landed the lead role in the upcoming FX series adaption of Kazuo Ishiguro's novel Never Let Me Go. Uh, she will be portraying Thora, a teenage clone who escapes from the boarding school where she and her fellow clones are kept hidden from society. Uh, very dollhouse. So the series will also be starring Tracy Ullman, Kelly McDonald, Aisha Hart, and other talented actors. It's being written by the Never staff writer Melissa Iqbal, who wrote uh, the pilot and is a showrunner and also will executive produce. Uh, this will be marking the second adaptation of the novel, with the first being a 2010 movie starring Carrie Mulligan, Kira Knightley, and Andrew Garfield, uh, directed by Mark Romanek. Very cool. Variety reported the casting last October, which hinted that the Nevers was probably not returning for a second season because the actors are getting cast in other shows. Okay. Yeah, it's always a bit of a always a bad sign when one of your leads has moved to a different show. Yeah, I mean when when uh, Laura Donnelly got Werewolf by Night. I know that was just a one time thing, but I felt like that was a death death bell. Yeah. I mean, like she, it was, it, it was a sort of special presentation, but at the same time, she's playing a fairly prominent character in that. And with the introduction of like Blade and Black Knight, they do seem like they're edging more into that kind of the sort of the monster verse within Marvel. So I mean, you can't really have that without her. Uh, so let's do a brief recap of the previous episode. What happens previously on the Nevers, we see Lavinia locks down the orphanage and confronts Amalia, who had broken into a mental hospital to steal Dr. Haig's files. Uh, uh, Cousins heals her wounds and they kiss, but he stops it from going any further. Amalia, uh, sorry, uh, Malady threatens to kill Dr. Haig. Lucy shatters the orb holding the alien, causing an earthquake that topples buildings. Uh, and then Amalia and Penance try to reach the cave. Lucy sees a baby alien creature, but Lavinia orders her to kill it. We were really mean about last about episode eight. Oh, really? But yeah, um, well, we, we weren't we weren't as mean as we were about seven, but we weren't particularly pleasant about it. But actually, I I, I have to say, of the three I watched, episode nine, Fever, was probably my favorite. Yeah. Because I mean, as we're about to, as I'm about to explain to you, it was a fairly packed episode. So, episode 9 of The Nevers, Fever, starts with a flashback to Lavinia and August, Augustus as children. Augustus shows Lavinia his aviary, which is an absolute freaking horror show. It's just dead birds everywhere. So, Lavinia does us, Lavinia does us all a favour and just burns it to the ground. In the present day, Lavinia is buried under r- rubble, and Augie tries to free her, while Amalia and Penance get separated. Amalia sees a string of lights inside the walls and follows them, leading her to find Lucy barely alive, who tells her that the alien sang to her before dying. Penance arrives to see this, and Amalia orders her to follow her through the tunnel. Meanwhile, Hugo refuses to see his dying father, and Mundy gets files on Mary's murder from the chief and tells him that Masson was behind it. Augie demands answers from Lavinia, but she reveals that she resents the aliens for giving him his powers. Malady has visions of the alien crawling through the tunnels and makes Haig dig a deeper hole. When Amalia and Penance trek through the tunnels, 
is interrupted by Malady, and Malady deduces that Malady can find the alien. They fight until they see the alien swimming around in a pool, and both swim after it. But the alien sees them and connects them via a glowing light coming from its body that overtakes them as the episode ends. This episode was written by Zoe Dennis and Rami Park and directed by Jennifer Getzinger. So, I mean, personally, this was my favorite of the first three episodes. What did you think of this one, Drago? Yeah, I think I agree with you. I, I, I just, fair warning, watched this episode like uh, four to five hours ago. So it, it might still be digesting um, in my belly, but I it had strong moments and it had interesting uh, confrontations. I... I was also underwhelmed by some of the payoffs. Um, like, for example, I was hoping for a more explosive meeting between Haig and Malady, but it just kind of felt limp and flaccid. Um, but the ending uh, was very strong. That was an emphatic under the water. Uh, it, and again, like we'll talk about this more later, but it kind of brought me back to what I loved about this show from the first half uh, in the very first episode, which was Mary's song. Uh, that was my, that was so beautiful. Uh, and I loved the ending of this episode uh, for that reason. I don't know. Just, it, it was, it was a, it was a nostalgic. Yeah, that's fair. I think it's a fairly accurate summation of the episode, but Diving in a little bit deeper to the individual scenes, how do you feel like the flashback scene between Lavinia and Augie as children? Do you think, how do you think that shed light on their current relationship and both of their spaces within the series? Okay, so I, I, I just want to read what I wrote down as a note on this particular point. Uh, I said, Augie going dark, bitch. So I feel like that <laughs> that was wonderful. I, I think... Uh, so I... I feel like we should expect this in any kind of Whedon verse thing when you have a bumbly yeah. kind of a British character who starts off as a comic relief. That character is going to transform into uh, a dark character. Uh, the Wesley archetype uh, being the yes. primary example of that. And I love that they're going this direction because honestly, the character of Augustus was just kind of becoming a... Um, a caricature, uninteresting, too stuttery, uh, cartoonish, uninteresting. But I love that they got those serial killer vibes in there, uh, and they're and they're really. I I hope they go heel turn. Like I really want to see him become uh, even worse than Lavinia. Oh, I I. 100 percent sure that's where they're going with it the whole like the, like when i saw this but i was like oh damn like that's this is the start of his heel turn so i'm quite glad you used that exact phrasing because it's like we're clearly on a level here here's the thing i agree with you that this is 100 <laughs> percent like this is a whedon plot point i don't know if he like he, he didn't write this script but clearly this was in his plan for the series but I can't help but think this was in his plan for maybe season three or four. It's too early for Augie to have a heel turn. Because, I mean, just as you said, he's not really a character at this point. Augie, as a being within the show, is defined by his relationship to the other characters rather than any real character of his own. Like, yeah, he's Augie. He's... Lavinia's brother. He is uh, Penance's love interest. He is um, Hugo's kind of foil. He's not like rec- he's described very much by what he is to other people rather than who he is as his own character. So having it suddenly revealed, oh, he's a freaking psychopath. Shocker. It's like, yeah, okay, that's that's a that's a good twist. It's, it's a good turn. But I can't help but think if they'd had a little bit more time to build up his relationship with Penance, particularly because Penance being like just the cinnamon roll of the show, having her like really fall for this guy, <laughs> having us kind of fall for him through her, like seeing how happy he makes her and like liking him as you know, liking them as a couple, having it then be like, oh, by the way, guess what? He tortures small animals for fun and thinks it's science. 
that would have like that would have really properly hit and that would have been amazing as it is now it was a strong moment in the episode but it it feels a little bit half-baked for me I see what you're saying. Four episodes. Well, first, well, well, talking about half baked. First of all, I I did not know cinnamon roll was a term used to describe characters, and I would like to know more about the history and etymology of that term. Uh, but I would just push back a little bit uh, because I feel like you're right when you say that he's not really a defined character. He is a very passive character, and and in large part defined by his relationship to other characters. I would say that what he is is a character who is largely under the influence or control of other characters. And what I liked about his, I don't think it was a full heel turn because it, he doesn't seem to have any malicious motives in the present. Um, I think maybe that is for season two or three, the fictional season that will never come. Uh, but for the present moment, I like the, the, I like the flip of him kind of being under the control of his sister, uh, from, like going from that to taking control of the birds. It feels like, it feels like, um, he's, it doesn't feel like he's turning evil this episode. It feels like, it feels like he's coming into his own, if that makes sense. And we'll talk about this more. Yeah. I, I definitely, I definitely kind of, I can see that sort of uh, interpretation of the event and it does, that does make sense. And I, I do like the kind of, you're not trapped in, like I'm not trapped in here with you, you're trapped in here with me kind of vibe to that scene. Like we, we very much, up until this point, it was very much like, oh yeah, Lavinia's so horrible. She's really kind of, you know, keeping Augie under her thumb. And it's like, okay, she was doing that for us. Yeah, because if that is what he does when he's left to his own devices, we don't want him doing that. Hmm. I like the use of birds, like the use of the shark in Jaws. Just anytime you see a bird, you you should feel a little terror in your heart. I think that's perfect. There's there's a lot they could do with that. Like, oh, we're free. Like, we've, we've escaped, and then you just see like a a lone crow circling <laughs> above. Like, uh oh. You can't escape. Literal yeah. eye in the sky. Just a dark cloud uh, comes over the, the camera and, and all of our characters are suddenly overcome. Yeah. Awesome. But from one mysterious twist that we never could have seen coming to another person acting basically as we expected him to, what did you think of Masson's decision not to kill his daughter and his reasoning behind it? Well, I think he ultimately does decide to kill his daughter, right? But with poison at the very end. But I, what I liked was when he decided to try to be a father for a second. I just liked, I just loved his daughter not giving a fuck and going straight for his heart with her claws. I thought that was, I, I thought that was perfect. It had real kind of you reap what you sow feel to it. Like, yeah, you can try and be all nice now, but sorry, we all know exactly who you are. And no one knows that more than she does. So step the fuck back. I think in that moment, she kind of disowns him in the same way he disowned her. Yeah, so it's, you feel like kind of that mutual it's severing of bonds. Estrangement, severing of bonds, yeah. Masson was one of those characters that I was really excited for going into this show. I don't know if it's just that, like, they haven't had the time to develop him, but it, yeah, it just, it feels like he's more of a plot device than a character, and I kind of wish they'd done more with him, because he's a great actor. Yeah, he has such a gravitas as a character, and I think you're right. It, he just feels like a cardboard cutout at this point of some, something they're trying to get across in the story. I don't know. Uh, mm. I feel like in the right circumstances, device. he could be a more righteous version of Littlefinger from Game of Thrones. Very much so, yeah. Kind of the grey man behind the scenes, do, like doing what's right for the good of the of queen and country. Exactly. Mm. exactly. But yeah. right now, he just seems kind of meh. So, what do you uh, what do you think about the revelation that Lavinia knew Augustus was touched and um, her resentment towards the Galanthi. 
I, I these. I'm kind of torn. I can't tell if I actually really loved that scene or I just loved her performance in that scene. Like she's just a uh, Olivia, just Lavinia. Like any time she says anything, she's just amazing. It doesn't matter how horrible she's being. You're just like yes, that freaking performance, so good. So it's like you could really it, it had that sort of it's like when you're feeling really ill and you finally sort of throw up and then you feel better after she's, she's like you can tell this resentment has just been building in her for like decades and she knows exactly who Augie really is like he is a freaking monster and she's like here's me you know stuck in this freaking chair like yeah, as you saw last week you have to have six different layers of armor just to be able to sit in my chair and then you're kind of gifted these amazing powers by these aliens that you're so sort of undeserving of like from her position you can kind of see why she might actually have developed such hatred for the galanthi considering like when when she sees what who they're given to and what they're given and she's just there trying to get by without them it's like yeah yeah she's definitely jealous i I think she's jealous and i i think i think it's a very good uh I think they, they execute that resentment pretty well because she definitely wants to be the one pushing Augie around. Ironically, and this is going back to a line in the first episode, because he's the one literally pushing her around in her wheelchair. And it's revealed in this one, he's also the one who literally pushed her at some point in the past into her uh, handicap uh, and so she she's she has this controlling thing. She wants to push him around, control him, own him, uh, know everything about him. She's like Big Brother, and uh, with the with the serial killer birds thing, I think like uh, she she's looking out for him possibly, but I think she's using that protectiveness uh, as an excuse to do to humans what he did to birds possibly because she's basically doing the same thing he did as a child except on a even worse scale she's sort of getting all down on doggy for his sort of vivisection of birds while supporting Haig, who does the same thing to humans exactly they're very similar the two of them oh very very much so yeah to the point that actually i really want them to have a scene together and kind of embrace their in a darkness yeah <laughs> have like a kind of uh frankenstein and eagle thing going on oh okay yeah okay so uh what did you think of the scene where amalia finds lucy barely alive and hears her account of the alien singing so good here's the thing i as i've mentioned every five minutes for all three of these episodes i watched the first three episodes back to back and kind of just you know channeled them through it. I'm, I'm now going to go an episode at a time because Last week we were recording with Tanisha and we were talking about that scene and she's like, oh yeah, you know, like Lucy, I'm like she's gonna, she's gonna do this and she's gonna do that and I really want this to be the path she takes. And I'm like, yeah, I can totally <laughs> see that happening. Like just trying so hard not to spoil anything. Like to be fair, they were all like they were all strong theories and like any of the things we came up with, I would have loved to have seen happen. But yeah, we just. Uh, I think that's a microcosm I mean, of the entire show. And there is a certain kind of not duality but there's a certain kind of poetic resonance to the whole thing like as we were saying last week you know she uses her powers to finally free this child and gets to finally hold a baby without killing it and then it sings her away as she leaves forever but i mean elizabeth barrington is such a freaking amazing actor like, I, I kind of wish we could have seen more from her but to go out in such a, a brilliant beautiful scene like i can't fault that man yeah, I, that, that is a poetic way for her to leave. She does kind of, she is kind of the midwife of the Galanthi. She helps deliver it from uh, from its cocoon, from its womb uh, into the world. That's a motherly task. And I mean, to, do, to use her powers to do it, it's just, it's kind of, it's very redemptive for her. And then she gets to kind of go out on a high note and hopefully finally find that peace she's been missing all these years 
So what do you think will happen to Malady now that she has seen the alien and is kind of connected to it with Amalia via this kind of... It's really continuing a theme. this kind of umbilical cord of light connecting the two of them after the whole kind of, you know, the birth of the Galanthi. Where do you like? What do you think that's gonna? How's that gonna play out? I think she finally becomes the leader, because they hinted at it at the at the start how compassionate and caring she was for Amalia when she had first shown up in the nut house or whatever that's called. I think I think Malady, I think Malady is the leader of the orphanage, ultimately, and I think half of the orphanage tried to rescue her. So clearly, there's a Clearly, they're willing to be on her side, and she is the the most famous symbol of the touched. So I feel like she would have to be the one. And given the given the the army that's being assembled uh, by the Masson and the Beggar King, it feels like like we've seen Malady and Amalia at odds. I think soon the Avengers are going to have to assemble to fight this army and these characters who have fought each other for the whole season will come together and join forces as king and queen of the orphanage and hopefully uh, that's my prediction but i haven't seen past episode nine so i don't know if you have no i'm I'm now gonna like this is the last episode i watched and from now on i will be watching an episode a week as we record so i'm not aware of i'm not having to conceal any potential spoilers okay cool 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 so we're both in the dark yar unlike amalia and malady who are connected by the light but yeah i hadn't thought of malady becoming kind of a a faith-esque leader of the orphanage we were very much betting on um annie carby bonfire taking over as the new leader because she kind of seems to be going down that path but actually I could, I could very much see Malady becoming Ma Lady well as we know like Bonfire Annie was following Malady at the beginning true it's very possible that Malady will be kind of Malady, Malady will be the leader and then Annie will be kind of her penance keeping her in check oh, yeah. and assisting where required how did you feel the episode handled Hugo's conflict with his father and his decision to ignore the news of his father's death and continue with his bacchanalia? Well, I think it's been it's been made pretty clear that his father was abusive at some point. So clearly that was a kind of ghost that was haunting him. And we'll talk more about this in the in or at least I will in the thematic discussion. But uh, I, I I think he was happy at the end. He, he was finally freed from this kind of weight or burden of the pressure of having to confront his father that he ultimately didn't have to do. Interesting. I actually had almost the exact opposite take. Ooh. So it's going to be quite fun. Yeah, because I mean, he was obviously, he was putting off going to see him because his relationship with his father is, was rather taught shall we say and there was just something on his face in that last scene and kind of everyone was partying around him and he was just kind of sitting there it had a real kind of going through the motions feel to it like laugh so you don't cry type thing it was i, I got a real vibe of kind of he's moments from breakdown but doesn't want you know, he, what he wants to like he's he can't handle what's just happened. He doesn't know how to process what's just happened. So he's decided to just revert back to, I am Hugo, king of the parties. And so we're going to kind of almost, you know, uh, fiddle as Rome burns. Like, everything's fucked. So I'm just going to throw a huge party and get really drunk and do a bunch of drugs and put off my problems till tomorrow. <laughs> Yeah, but I would say because he's so clearly agitated for so much of the episode and he's so agitated about the party itself and he's in this state of hyper anxiety. And then as soon as that letter comes in, just the a very the abruptness of the change of his mood from agitation to a very sudden calm. Uh, I don't know. It. I don't know if maybe it is a put on, maybe it is a 
inability to process what's happening, but it feels more positive to me than negative as far as even temperamentally. I'm that, that would just be the unsettled thing to say, but I, I, I think, I think sometimes your parent needs to be dead. I mean, if they're as, as horrible as Hugo's seem to be, yeah, I think yeah, and you I, can't really become who you are meant to be until you are free from the shackles of what they want you to be. That's right. And I think he can probably relate to Masson's daughter in that sense. They're both kind of, they're both kind of like, uh, clawing at the heart of their parent without any regard for the fact that this is their parent. I think they both don't care. Yeah, which then kind of raises an interesting question is how do you think that's going to play into Hugo and Masson's relationship, especially if we're right and Masson does go on to kill his daughter? We'll, we'll then have two quite taut parent and child relationships, one where the child is no longer alive and one where the parent is no longer alive but due to circumstances of upper class, they're forced to kind of interact and possibly work together. It'll be interesting to see how those two handle each other. Oh, yeah. Well, they always have interesting conversations. I think with the fact that Frank, the detective, is kind of gunning for Masson, there may be potential for a partnership to form there between uh, Hugo and Frank, and maybe they'll both go after Masson. Yeah. This is the point where I would just slide this in there. Was it just me, or is everyone now 1,010% shipping Hugo and Mundy? No, it wasn't just you. I, I think that's a pretty common ship. Because <laughs> you know. I was going to say, the, the sexual tension in their scenes this episode was insane mm. like, I don't know if that's just like natural chemistry between the actors or if that was in the script or what but yeah like that was damn if the, if the show finishes and those two don't hook up at least once something has clearly been vetoed by <laughs> the powers that be because it's, that's clearly the direction they're going yeah, no, I think it's. I think that's pretty unsubtle too. It, it just like Hugo says, uh, why, why don't you ever just come visit me? You know, you always come for some business or something. Why, why don't you ever just come see me? And they have that moment of charged, like electric energy. All right. Well, uh, we see Lavinia and Augustus as children and learn about their shared trauma. Uh, how did the childhood experience shape their current relationship, do you think? Oh, badly, I would say. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it very much, it did make me feel a little sorrier for Lavinia until, again, you pointed out that actually she's doing far worse now. So, yeah, she clearly didn't learn a lesson. But, yeah, like, seeing that she's kind of almost been protecting the world from Augie, who it turns out is kind of terrifying and how or rather has the potential to be absolutely terrifying it was very interesting and see, seeing that he was the one that put her in the chair and kind of gave her these horrific in, 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 gave her these horrific injuries it's it was a very informative episode i think it shed a very new and interesting light on their interactions yeah but once again like they both have justifications for the demented shit that they did or are doing like Augie says I was just a kid it was a mistake and we don't really know because in the flashback he doesn't say he heard the birds he said he found them uh is he finding dead birds or is he killing them is it a post-mortem dissection I don't know so you know there's still space for it to be innocent although I'm, I'm, I'm not anticipating that um but I feel like the chief thing that I got from the flashback is, and uh, uh, Matthew mentions the theme of control that comes up later, uh, but the idea of Lavinia being famously controlling 
because she wants to control Augie. She controls the orphanage. She controls Amalia. She, she wants to be kind of the domineering force. Uh, and Augie doesn't like, seem to like the fact that he's being controlled by his sister. Meanwhile, he's literally the same as her. He's, he's being controlling of the birds, right? And now we know that the birds are not necessarily his friends. They could be his victims. That's the, that's the creepiest part. It really kind of, again, it, it plays on the idea of kind of power imbalance. Like, we think he's very much the one in the sort of, the, in heavy air quotes, the kind of the weaker position here. But actually, he's then doing the exact same thing to other people and other things. And it's like, he's a very bad person, too. That goes so, back to the very first scene of Buffy, where you have that, like, these two teenagers uh, going into high school uh, late at night when they're not supposed to. And the girl is kind of, like, scared. And she's like, I don't know if I want to do this. I mean, it might be We might get in trouble. And then the boy's like, no, come on, let's go. And then there's these sounds in the dark. And she's like, go check it out. And then when he goes and checks it out, she's the predator, not the victim, and kills him when we thought. It's just, I guess what you're saying, it's a trope reversal of... You know, the cheerleader is not the victim and the, the girlfriend is not the the victim. She's actually the vampire. Um, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, he does love flipping those things on their heads. And speaking of, this episode does explore the idea of kind of power dynamics and control with Masson's attempts to control his daughter's life and Malady's use of violence to control whoever she feels like. How do you think those themes particularly played out throughout this episode? So I actually wrote down a list of all of the the instances of this. So I'll just recite it for you real quick. So the, these are these are as far as I can tell all of the instances of control. So I feel like Horatio is controlled by his love for Amalia until he tells her to stop being an asshole. Uh Haig is controlled by the trauma of Malady until he blocks his ears and like shovels that henchman. Uh, I feel like Amalia is controlled by Lavinia's financial power over the orphanage. Uh, I've, Augie is controlled by Lavinia's power over him until he takes back control by controlling those birds. And then you have Lucy who's controlled literally in chains behind bars until she breaks out. Uh, you have Frank who's being controlled by the corruption of the police department until he decides to go rogue. You have Hugo being controlled by the phantom of his father, pressuring him to visit before it's too late, until it's finally too late. You have Masson being controlled by the council of politicians who are, like, nixing his ideas until he decides to go around them with the beggar king. Uh, you have Masson, who's also kind of held hostage by the banging of his daughter on that door until he decides to end her. Uh, you have everybody at the orphanage being controlled by the bad leadership of Amalia until they decide to stop relying on her and take care of themselves. And then finally, you have the Galanthi, who is controlled by um, Lavinia and kind of held hostage underground until Lucy breaks it out. And it's like free willy in the open water. So it feels to me like this episode and maybe overarching in this part of the season, it's kind of about the breaking free of control structures. Yeah. In a sense. Yeah, no, no, no. Very, very much so. Yeah, it does feel like they're showing the very... The, there's almost a catalogue of... If, like, control isn't just, you know, a person standing over another with a stick saying, do this or I'll hit you. Like, there are many and varied, subtle and, you know, overt and covert ways for one person to have control over another. And yes, more often than not, those ways are bad. But sometimes, like with Livinia and Augie, it's very much kind of the letter of two evils. You have to control one person to stop them from doing something that may be potentially worse than the still bad but smaller evil of you trying to kind of squash them. 
But then as this show goes on, is there is very much just everything is unraveling and chaos is here. So all those forms of control are slowly but surely loosening and some breaking altogether. So you have to wonder who is going to survive this entirely uncontrolled landscape and you know i mean yes control generally is a bad thing when used for uh, unfair reasons but is a total lack of control of anyone any better i would also put i would add to that incredibly comprehensive list uh the beggar king was using his kind of his knowledge he was he was controlling the girl who's now I should probably learn because she's I'm guessing she's gonna be quite important in the later episodes. He was kind of using her own hatred and kind of bigotry against the touched to control like she went from wanting him dead to being his number one fan after that freaking meeting in the I wanna say barn. Like she was there to take him down and now like she is loyal to the end she loves him yeah he's he's like her harry styles now at this point i i was so i i'm so annoyed by her character i was hoping nick frost would kick her in the head i just i don't like that character i don't like how smirky she is and how confident she is i don't know there's there's, it's very off-putting I'm kind of hoping she's meant to be like that because if not, someone's really messed up because, yeah, she's just a thoroughly, thoroughly odious little shit. And I'm guessing they're setting her up to be a foil for one of the touched, possibly Viola, but I'm not... I mean, I think Myrtle, my right? money would very much be... Yes, that is her character name. Sorry, I was... Viola's the actress, derp. Yeah, Mer- they're very much setting her up to be a foil for Myrtle, but I'm I'm just wondering how that would ever play out because unless she kind of just unless they hug it out, I can't really see Myrtle coming out well from that confrontation. Yeah, I she's like that character whose name I will I refuse to learn is just like boringly sadistic, you know. It doesn't really seem like she has any honest anger. It just seems like she's happy with uh, causing as much pain as possible because of some kind of irrational phobia. Yeah, it's like a phobia. She she's she's like touched phobic. I mean, thirty seconds on Twitter will show you that people like that exist and they're everywhere. So having one of them as a foil in the show probably isn't the worst idea but yeah she is rather hard to watch but i'm wondering if we will get a moment where i mean since myrtle's power is kind of knowing all the languages will she get a kind of voice of all things type upgrade where she learns to control it and knows how to kind of speak to anyone and will talk that girl down from her murderous rage and get her to confess what it is that made her such a tart and then maybe they will become best friends afterwards (laughs) yeah or maybe she'll just electrocute her with that umbrella that works too yeah probably it would require a lot less screen time so yeah let's, let's just go that way so we learn more about the alien and its ability to connect people through a glowing light what do you think this symbolizes and how does it tie into the larger themes of the show i slightly touched on this earlier but yeah i mean i think the kind of umbilical connection does seem to be like there's a very strong theme of kind of birth and rebirth throughout this series really so having a character who can literally kind of connect you with these umbilicals of light yeah and when you when you when you look at just building on what you just said the fact that that umbilical connection happens underwater that's very amniotic that's basically a a womb 
Absolutely, yeah. I, I, I throw the place in the water as well, so that's really doubling down on the kind of rebirth metaphor. Which makes you wonder, since this is, like, they are going to be connected to each other, they're going to see each other's memories, possibly feel how they feel now and then and in the future and whatever. Will this be a literal rebirth for the pair of them? Will they be the same people when they come out? No, they're not, they're not literally going to be different. Like, will they have kind of reached a new level of understanding once this all concludes? And could that be what sets um, Malady off on her path to becoming the new leader of the orphanage? I think so. And I think it's, I think for the show, I think they really need Amalia to have a rebirth because she's been kind of statically, um, de- not depressed, but, uh, dis- despairing. Her, her, her despair has been very static and it, probably for too long because we already covered this ground in the first half of the season and she's back to where she started, which I understand for a TV show, you can't just cure a character. They have to, you, they have to be designed for long term abuse. So you, you kind of have to, they, she has to suffer. I understand that, but it's also like, I want the next episode to start with them climbing out of the lake and just, I don't know looking into each other's eyes and apologizing and hugging each other and and uh, playing patty cake and ho- holding hands and skipping i feel like that ha- there has to be a change yeah i mean i think that that, that prediction became slightly less and less likely <laughs> as it went on but if we just focus on the first couple of points i think there is every chance that could happen yeah so, yeah i mean it would be very uh very kind of on brand for the show so far to start that way. I think the main thing that I'm hoping doesn't happen is that the Galanthi becomes a baby Yoda character. I don't want the, I don't want it to get out of that lake. I want it to just kind of swim away and be mysterious and they, they lose touch with it or something, but I don't want it to be waddling around and cute. No, I don't think it's going to be waddling. I think the, only way I see it leaving that building is if Amalia takes it, kind of swaddles it up, takes it to the orphanage, dumps it there, and moves on. Because unless, obviously, they go through the big heartwarming rebirth revelation, which is entirely possible, Amalia, as she is now, does not have a maternal bone in her body. I can't see her just adopting this baby. So I think it's either going to never leave the pond, or it will be taken out and then just dumped in the orphanage and then she will fracking run because yeah otherwise it it would feel very odd to me yeah and she does kind of say goodbye to penance right there at the end right so it could be the end of amalia for a while maybe she does just kind of run away and malady is left picking up the pieces and then on a on an unsubtle note I think it's been pointed out several times that the Galanthi should mean hope. So, you know, it's like a, I guess it's like a more passive Superman symbol. So this episode also touches on resentment and revenge, with Lavinia revealing her resentment towards Augustus and Malady seeking revenge against those who have wronged her. How does this theme relate to the overall story of the Nevers? Yeah, I don't know. I, th- those are definitely things. Those those are definitely popular themes in every story that's ever been written. So it it's here for sure. And and the payoff, I I hope, is a Tarantino style massacre of every bad evil character in the end. I think this episode had to touch on touch on that kind of those themes because connecting to the bit we saw before with the glowing light, I feel like this was kind of Malady lancing that boil to use another slightly disgusting term, Just getting all that spite and that vengeance out, discarding it so that she could then go into the pool unite with Amalia 
and emerge a better person. I, yeah, I don't know why. I can't see. I mean, Amalia, I feel, yeah, he's either going to just disappear and kind of turn up again in probably a cliffhanger ending of the penultimate episode and then be important in the finale. Mm Mm-hmm. Or she will stay here the whole time, but she will just be the same old freaking Amalia. Meanwhile, I have a feeling this episode, where Malady was at the end of this episode, is very much going to be... An, an, there's going to be a new Malady going forward from here, tying in to the overall theme of Rebirth. Yeah, I don't know if we talked about this. By the way, very well said. I don't know if we talked about this yet, but in episode eight, Amalia's flashbacks are very much about war and trauma and PTSD. But in this one, they're about baking and kneading and dough. And so I do you have any thoughts about that shift? It, it does feel like the episode seven flashbacks were very much Zephyr's flashbacks. And then the episode eight flashbacks were very much Amalia's flashbacks. So you have to wonder, like, is that because the Zephyr personality is kind of not losing control, because control, but kind of they are very much approaching a sort of crux point. And it's, it's, I mean, I think it ties into what I was saying before about how, like in our previous episode, about how I just, I, Amalia may survive past the final episode, but I don't think Zephyr will. And I think this all just kind of leans into that. That's interesting because it, right now Zephyr has control over the body of Amalia totally. So if we see her kind of um, go in the opposite direction, th- I mean, that would be a more bright, loving, happy Amalia from what I remember of, of that flashback sequence in episode 6. She was, she was a pretty bright-eyed character who, who wanted to fall in love and, you know, have a family and had maternal instincts to an extent. Okay, so... Uh, this So, the episode ends on a cliffhanger with Amalia and Malady overtaken by the alien's glowing light. What do you think this means going forward? And we did touch on this already, but do you have any further thoughts about that? Actually, I do. Thank you for asking. I have a distinct suspicion that episode 10 is going to start with a kind of memory sequence if you heavy air quotes i think episode the next episode is going to start with like amalia and malady in some kind of thoughtscape seeing who the other one is like learning to accept them yada 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 i also think that's when it's going to be revealed i mentioned it last week i think malady has another traveler from the future in her head but because of Malady's mental, like, um, sort of mental conditions and state, the other personality couldn't fully take over in the same way that Zephyr took over Amalia. And I think that's going to be revealed in the next episode. And Malady will possibly either do something to kind of rectify that situation or will come to terms with the situation and will find a way to move on from that while Amalia will either like, assist and then kind of move on with her or just have a, a very Amalia meltdown. I'm fine for either because either way it's going to be great television. The, that's an interesting theory about the hitchhiker from the future. I like your I like your idea though about the thoughtscape that they like they visit each other's memories and uh kind of come to an understanding of each other. I think that would be cool. Like, you can see Amalia visiting the tortures of Malady in that underground dungeon, and she feels culpable for it because she kind of sold her down the river. And then, you know, Malady gets to visit the war of the future, and she sees the extraordinary, like, strife 
and conflict and explosions and stuff. And then, you know, they both come out of that. They're like, oh, shit. Okay. We we trauma bonded. <laughs> yeah. So, highlight standout performances and moments from episode nine. Which character's backstory surprised you the most in this episode? I mean, is there... There is a correct answer. Is there any answer other than Agi? That has to be the one. Yeah, absolutely. Like, that was bolt out of the blue. Classic Whedon twist. Need a little more weight to it, but even just as it was there, love it. Yeah, he's he's still he's still a mystery. We don't really know how his backstory is going to inform his motivations going forward, but it definitely makes him way more interesting. Absolutely. I mean, I I you know I've sort of made mention of him not really being a character. I think this is definitely what's going to sort of build towards him having some form of plot or impact on the greater plot. I just hope it doesn't ruin his relationship with Penance. You know what I just remembered um, when uh, when Augie's first introduced in the pilot episode, he says something about a group of crows being called a murder of crows, right? Hmm. I don't know if you remember that, but but he, he he there's a whole conversation about a murder of crows, and I'm wondering if the the word murder was an ominous kind of harbinger, foreshadowing. Possibly, I mean, yeah, you could have mentioned the you know, Parliament of Rooks, a court of owls. Like there are other equally as well known plural group versions, group, yeah. group nouns, plural plurals nouns. that he could have used. So going going with a murder of crows is a very weighted phrase. Kind of reminds me of in uh, Firefly, where it's, uh, Zoe talks about like a feeling sanguine it means hopeful. Point of fact, also means bloody. Oh, he does love to play with words. Yeah, and he literally does murder a, a bunch of birds in the backstory we see here. Also, that yeah, here. yeah. So how do you feel about Lavinia's resentment towards Augustus? We talked about this. Yeah, I mean, I think it, uh, it made a lot of sense for her and it made her a much more forgivable, I suppose, to an extent, character. But at the same time, as you, as you pointed out, it then may, it kind of makes it all the more confusing that she's been doing this nonsense with Hay when she's you know, she reacting in horror to her brother doing these things to birds and then paid a guy to do it to humans why would why would you not learn that lesson yeah well i think like she burned down his little cabin maybe she's trying to burn down the galanthi that resentment is love Mm -hmm. i do have to mention though because this line stood out she said i taste the very air before you breathe it that i that was that's the worst line of dialogue i've ever heard that was so bad I'm sorry that the rest of it is good, but I, I wanted to highlight that as a particularly bad piece of dialogue. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest. I was I was kind of trying to pick out great quotes from the episode, and I couldn't really think of any. I had to pause. I had to pause the episode and recover for like a minute before I continued. After I heard that, <laughs> the very air. Uh, how do you feel about the the final scene with the glowing light and the alien? You loved it. Very very strong last scene. Loved yeah, it. like yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think that was the best kind of stinger we've had so far. I'm very excited to see how that plays out, and I will be very disappointed if it doesn't play out the way I want it to. Same, ditto. So, what are your overall thoughts of episode nine? Uh, it was uh, it had some good moments. It was definitely an episode of television. Uh, it it had um, it had some stuff to it. I enjoyed it reasonably. That that's the most effusive praise that I can give. Yeah, I mean it was probably my favorite of this back half so far, but. That is a really low bar to clear. So I hope it gets better from now on. But if it doesn't, this was still 
you know a solid episode of television yeah it was it 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 it, it's just and i don't know if you might agree with this or not but it does feel a little bit like a shell of itself from absolutely prior episodes like this, this the whole back half of the season has just not been as good as the first half we've we've kind of belabored this point already but i think we can't really let an episode review go without saying it at least once so uh yeah get ready to hear this a bit more it, it's just unless it gets a lot better really really fast then uh this back half has just not been good so speaking of the next episode apparently next time almost immediately countering every theory we've had so far for episode nine in the next episode malady escapes from the river and kills her husband so no redemption there meanwhile cousins discovers that his son's drawings reveal their future and augustus takes charge of lavinia's fundraiser for the orphanage awesome Meanwhile, Lavinia meets with Masson and shows him photographs of the orb holding the alien, and the dinner becomes tense as he arrives and reveals his true identity to Penance. There you go. Oh, that's going to be a belter of a scene. Later, Amalia crawls out of the river and meets her future self. That sounds quite fun, but don't care. All I want to see is Haig and Penance having a scene together. That is going to be a barn burner. So, uh, If you want to come back and hear us, hopefully being very excited for how well that scene plays out, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, and YouTube. Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, we are at HBO The Nevers, and on Twitter, we are at The Nevers Podcast, P O D C S T. Comments or questions to The Nevers Podcast at gmail.com. If you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts, please remember to leave us a rating and a review. Thank you very much, Shirag, for joining me today. Yeah, no, it, it was, it was fun. It was fun talking about it, and, um, you can't find me anywhere. I'm untraceable. But uh, maybe on the next episode you could find me. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, I used to be untraceable. It was fun. But now I'm fucking everywhere. You can't escape me. Sorry. But yeah, until next time, see you around. This episode of the Nevers Podcast was written, produced, and edited by Matthew at Culture Inject Studios. The intro and outro music was produced by Gilirme Morais. We are more than just a podcast. We're a fan community. You can keep up to date on the Nevers and chat with other fans by visiting hbothenevers.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Just search HBO The Nevers, all one word, and click that follow button. The Nevers Podcast is not endorsed by Mutant Enemy, Warner Media Entertainment, or any of its subsidiaries, including Home Box Office, HBO, and is intended for entertainment and educational purposes only. The Nevers and all names, pictures, and audio clips are registered trademarks and or copyrights of their respective copyright holders. 